This is uh, Dr. Lisa Binzel. She's a nurse practitioner on our surgical uh, oncology department at Montemore House. And I'm gonna let her disclose anything else that she wants to talk about. <laughs> Thanks, Finn, for inviting me to talk to you guys. Good morning and welcome um, to the sixth annual uh, Melanoma Patient Education Symposium. Um, as Finn says, I am a nurse practitioner. I work, work in, primarily in the surgical oncology division uh, where I see most of our patients when they first come in with their initial diagnosis of melanoma. The important thing to remember is surgic uh, surgery is usually the initial or primary path of treatment for most melanomas. Um, unfortunately, we don't always get uh, melanomas stopped at the initial stages where they don't have to progress onto additional adjuvant therapies, which will be addressed later on this afternoon. Um, our surgery guidelines are based on very strict um, guidelines as far as how we treat certain stages of melanoma. The American Joint Committee on Cancer has released its eighth edition. They have tightened up some of the criterion for treating melanomas, especially in the initial staging in the thinner melanomas. The, sorry, this slide is pretty busy. Um, really the biggest changes have been in this T1 staging. In the T category of melanoma, deals with the actual thickness of the primary lesion. There are three, initial, uh, three actual um, processes that go into the overall staging of patients. The T is the tumor thickness. N is the evidence or absence of nodal metastasis. And M is the presence or absence of distant disease from the primary site in the regional nodal. So when we're talking staging of melanoma, we're talking the overall encompassing of all these things, the, the tumor thickness, the nodal metastasis, and the uh, presence of distant metastasis. So that's what goes into actually staging melanomas. Um, initially, uh, a lot of patients that I see initially are under the impression that they have, usually have a, a higher staging of melanoma than they actually do because a lot of times the pathology reports will be given to them and they'll try to look at um, their melanoma and then they get on the internet and they think, well, oh, I'm gonna figure out what stage I am. I highly encourage you um, to not do that, especially when we're talking about three different levels. And most of the time when you come in to see us initially, we don't have the other two levels, the nodal status and the uh, metastatic status. So keep in mind that when you're looking at your, your report, you may see a Clark level on there, and that can go from one to four. That has nothing to do with your staging. So don't be alarmed when you see a Clark level four. You're not a, you may or may not be a stage four melanoma. So that's the one thing, if anything, you take out of the staging talk is keep in mind that there are multiple things that go into your staging and not one thing will make your clinical staging. Um, the nodal staging has not changed much at all. In fact, it hasn't changed at all. This is the presence or absence of, of lymph node involvement, and this is found during your surgical intervention for your melanoma if you need to have a nodal metastasis. Basically, when we're looking at patients who require nodal assessment, we're looking at stage with a T1, meaning it's greater than or equal to 0.8 millimeters or greater, or it's any size with the presence of ulceration on the top. And what ulceration means is that top layer of skin has been denuded or taken away. And it means that that melanoma has a little bit more aggressive t um, properties to it. So we wanna make sure that we address those during surgery. And so we will offer, at the time of your visit, we will offer nodal assessment which is done by sentinel lymph node biopsy, and I will talk about that here soon. So nodal metastasis here is just more of a staging process, and it goes into um, defining what survival is. Doesn't necessarily um, take into account what your therapies will be. Metastasis, basically this means this melanoma 
has leaped from its primary site to a totally different site in your body. It can be liver, lung, brain, visceral or um, intestinal organs. It can be skin. Um, uh, did I say lung? Yeah. So melanoma can really occur anywhere. So we keep our eyes on it. We ask very pointed and direct questions as far as assessing for the presence of distant metastasis. With the staging groups, and again, this is pretty uh, involved, we're looking at when it, you have an early stage melanoma, which is TIS, means in situ. This has not had any property of invasion into your skin. When you're, you have an in situ or T1A, more than likely you will be an NO or a nodal metastasis zero. And if your nodes are negative, the likelihood of you having a distant metastasis is also very low. That leads to stage zero and stage 1A overall, okay? So in these type of stagings, the primary surgical intervention would be a wide excision with adequate margins. When we're looking at stage T1B and down, we're looking at offering a further deeper, wider excision um, to encompass a little bit larger margin to ensure that we don't leave anything behind. We will always take the subcutaneous tissue from underneath the uh, lesion down to the mu muscle or to the um, fascial layer so that we make sure we get all that deep margin as well as a nice healthy rim around. So when we're looking at staging groups where we have no idea where the primary melanoma was, we have patients that show up with a lump in their uh, underarm, in their neck, in their groin, and we never find the primary lesion. So in this case, your T is X because we don't know. We go mostly on the nodal status. How many lymph nodes are, are involved? What is the appearance of those lymph nodes? Was that melanoma encapsulated in the entire lymph node or was it outside of the lymph node? Is there any evidence of melanoma somewhere else in the body? So we will do staging scans immediately on patients who pre uh, present with an unknown primary site. Your pathology stage, usually in, a, in an unknown primary, will start out in the threes, stage three. And then depending on how much lymph node involvement, in, it'll be a 3B or 3C. Basically, your therapies at that point in time will be in the same. You're going to have surgical excision of the involved area where the uh, metastasis is, and then proceed to adjuvant therapy. Okay, so in node positive patients, again, anyone with a positive lymph node is going to fall into stage three category. Anyone with metastasis anywhere else in the body will automatically make it a stage four category. And this is a little bit on staging. Your initial stage or your uh, staging of your melanoma is always based on the initial presentation of that melanoma. Um, as time goes on, you can add to that, but when you add to, um, to that staging diagnosis, you usually designate that with an R for recurrence. Someone who presents with a, a progressive melanoma that may not be a surgical candidate initially will be categorized with a Y prefix because those are the patients that we will refer to um, receive preoperative immunotherapy to try to shrink down the lesion or shrink down the metastatic disease to lessen the burden of surgical um, areas that we have to remove to decrease the long-term effects also on you that with the side effects. Person, oh, hello. I'm going, am I going, there I go. People who present with multiple primary melanomas, and this does happen, when you have been diagnosed with a, a melanoma, you are at a higher incidence of developing a second primary somewhere else. You always use the highest stage tumor stage for their initial staging or for their overall staging. So say somebody comes in with a um, four millimeter melanoma and based on the guidelines that would be a T4 
four, and depending on the presence of ulceration or not, would be an A or a B. Um, you would start with that versus, say, they have a melanoma in situ someplace else on their body. You always go with the primary or the higher staging melanoma for their overall staging examination or classification. Now, when we talk about surgical excision, margins are very important. Um, melanoma, it's important to do wide excisions for melanoma. Most surgery we reserve only for the extreme cases and people who are, are surgically uh, impaired where it's more of a detriment to, to do surgery on them than not. But your primary surgical intervention for melanoma should be a wide excision because that wide excision will, again, take that subcutaneous base all the way down to the fascia. It takes away that whole area to prevent the recurrence rate. Most surgery, unfortunately, takes as much as they need to get a clear margin and sometimes that's not quite enough. So we often see a lot of reoccurrence, local reoccurrence with most surgeries. When we're looking at in situ cancers, we like to recommend a 0.5 to one centimeter margin, which is about half an inch. With anything less than or equal to one, we recommend a wide excision of one centimeter margin, greater than one to two centimeters, or one to two millimeters, one to two centimeter, and again, that's a present. If, if there's a presence of any residual lesion in that area, we'll increase our margin status. Thicker melanomas, two millimeters and up, automatically get a two centimeter margin, which is an inch. And this is how we make our margins. A lot of people don't understand when they go into surgery that their incision is going to be a little bit bigger than what they thought it was going to be when they come out. So essentially, you have your primary lesion here. Um, and for posterity's sake, we're going to make this a T4 lesion. So this is going to be a two centimeter lesion, our two centimeter margin. So we draw a circle around that, that lesion. Now, unfortunately, we just can't bring that back together because otherwise you'll have a big pucker and not a nice looking scar. So cosmetically, we extend, darn it, we extend these lesions out to an elliptical incision so that when we bring you back together, it makes a nice smooth line. Sometimes you'll have little dog ears that stick up on the edges. We can fix that. That's not an issue. We usually like to let you heal about six to eight months after surgery because a lot of times those dog ears will soften out and make a nice smooth incision over top of that. So this is what your melanoma marking will look like the day of your surgery. So if you see, for every centimeter we go wide, we go too long. So that's why your incision is a lot larger than what you thought it would be. Now, as I was saying, there are some special circumstances that negate wide excision or surgical intervention. And these are people who have a high surgical risk, who have very bad cardiac disease, that it's a risk to put them to sleep. Um, people who have respiratory issues that we are afraid to put on ventilators and get them back off during, after surgery. So there are some additional therapies that we can offer. We can offer white excision alone under a local if it's possible to get them numb enough to do that. There's also a medication called Amiquimod or Aldera. We use this in rare cases where patients who are at surgical risk who have a thinner melanoma, um, we can apply a miquimod to the area and basically what it is is it's a chemical disquamation or a removal of the skin of those layers and it helps slough off that melanoma. It's a topical therapy and meaning you put it on top of the skin and you apply it Certain times we have to titrate it up and titrate it down to get the response that we need in order to treat the melanoma. We use these in, in patients who have a high uh, rates of clinical and histological clearance um, or they have a high uh, risk of recurrence in that area because the margin, we were unable to get a clear or uh, adequate margin, especially in anatomical areas like around the eyes, around the lips 
where we just can't seem to get it and it's a, a low level melanoma. Now obviously if there's a bulky disease, we've got to do something because that is going to reoccur. But the amiquimod is a nice alternative to treating um, close margins with early stage or early leftover melanomas. Um, these are some of the references that, that uh, support the use of the amiquimod therapy. In special situations, we will treat with radiation. Radiation is not a real good treatment for melanoma. It just doesn't seem to work, especially with thicker ones. But with uh, superficial melanomas, melanomas in situ, they can use light therapy or UV therapy to treat these. Uh, the systematic review of uh, the retrospective studies shows a, a variety of protocols and how to administer that radiation. You have about a 5% reoccurrence rate after about three years versus less than one in surgical excisions. And in the patients that they studied, the 349 patients that they studied in the retrospective review, five cases showed the progression from melanoma in situ or um, non-invasive melanoma into invasive melanoma forcing um, additional treatment with surgery and, and um, adjuvant therapy. So what do we do with those patients who uh, present with mel melanoma that are thick enough to worry about nodal metastasis? In order to understand where we're going in our surgical therapy, it's important to understand where we've come from. Way back in the dog and pony years, uh, when people were presented with melanoma, we would, pre we would offer wide excision only with adequate margins in or around the site. So we were not looking at um, the presence of nodal metastasis unless they showed evidence of uh, lumps or bumps during their clinical um, presentation. Then at that time, we would offer lymph node dissection. Um, in the early 90s, they came out with a procedure called sentinel lymph node biopsy. And they came with a study to look at what does the sentinel lymph node procedure offer to patients in melanoma. And it's a very powerful predictor of survival. Essentially what sentinel lymph node biopsy is, is finding the first lymph nodes in that chain that drain the skin area. We're able to remove them, we look at them under a microscope, we determine if they are involved with metastatic disease or not which will determine what additional therapies we need to do. In lymph node biopsies, they, have saw, they saw that there were fewer regional relapses. In other words, there were fewer recurrences in the nodal basins where the lymph nodes were located with the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And there was definitely less morbidity, meaning um, with a clinical lymph node following a positive sentinel node versus just going in and removing additional lymph nodes at the time of surgery. So what that meant is you decrease the complications of lymph node dissection, which can be lymphedema. You see a noticeable difference in this leg versus this leg. And basically what that is is decrease in the lymphatic drainage from the, the area where the nodal metastasis was at. So you decrease the risk of lymphedema, which decreases the um, risk of decreased range of motion or strength and, and mobility of the limb involved. You also decrease pain. You decrease neuropathy, which is pain of the nerves, numbness. Um, all these things are, are um, decreased, not totally eliminated. They can happen with sentinel node, but they are greatly decreased in patients who undergo sentinel lymph node biopsy versus complete lymph node dissection. So that led to a major trial called the MSLT1 trial. Essentially what this was was comparing the standard of care at that time, which was wide excision only of the melanoma, to patients who were randomized to local excision with sentinel lymph node biopsy. So these two therapies were gone head to head. So when you were randomized to the treatment group, which at that time was the lymph node biopsy because it was not standard care, found the lymph nodes. If the lymph nodes were negative, 
they went ahead and went on to survival, in other words, no additional surgical intervention. If the sentinel lymph node showed evidence of melanoma, then they went ahead and did the total lymph node dissection at that point in time. And they continued to compare these two groups over time to see if there was any difference in survival or reoccurrence. 2001 patients were uh, with primary melanomas measuring 1.2 to 3.5 millimeters were randomized to white excision alone versus sentinel node and white excision. They found that there was no difference in the 10 year survival. I've got 10 minutes. Ooh, okay. I'm just going to go through. Anyway, this, it, they showed that there was really no difference, which led to the next study, which is the MSL2 trial, which impacts our, t our studies today or our treatments today. We have found that patients who had sentinel lymph node biopsy, and basically what this was is we randomized people to lymph node, a white excision sentinel node biopsy, and if their nodes were positive, then they went into the, the treatment group of either observation with serial ultrasounds versus complete lymph node dissection. So the, what we're looking at now is do those people who have positive lymph nodes, do they do better or worse if they have a complete lymph node dissection versus observation? And what they found was there's no difference in overall melanoma survival, but there is a huge difference in the lymphedema and the postoperative complications of these patients. Now there is a slightly higher, ri higher rate of local reoccurrence in the nodal basin meaning they have a recurrent lymph node in the area where their sentinel lymph node was removed. But upon clinical dissection of those lymph nodes, at that time of uh, that they find that, there's no difference in the overall survival then at that time. So you can postpone a lymph node dissection if and only if you need it, and hopefully decrease the comorbidities that are associated with, with a, a complete lymph node dissection. Okay, so. Now we're going on to the new and, and really exciting area of, of um, melanoma. Emlygic is a viral therapy. And basically what it is, it's a genetically modified virus of the herpes virus. Okay, chicken pox, herpes, you've heard of all that. So what they've done is modify this virus and it gets injected directly into the lesions. Now this therapy is reserved for those patients who have had recurrent melanoma after their primary surgical intervention is completed. So these are uh, local reoccurrences in the skin, the fat, and in nodes that are palpable. Um, it's not been shown to over increase overall survival, but it does have a significant effect on the local disease there in making it regress and go away. It's important to never administer a, a live or a modified virus in anyone who is immunocompromised or pregnant because these viruses can have effect on their overall uh, uh, immune status. Basically, we start out with a, a, a sensitization dosage where we inject into the largest lesion first and then progress to any other lesions around. We can inject up to four milliliters of the fluid into the, the primary sites. Three weeks after the initial dose, then they start their maintenance dose. And we up that dose in order to get an immune response. And then patients are treated every two weeks following that. Um, Again, this just says how to administer it. The lesion size will determine exactly how much of the, the medication that we inject into the lesion. Again, we can inject up to a total of four mLs. And so based on the size of the lesion, say if you have one that's greater than five centimeters, which is pretty large, you would go ahead and inject the whole four mLs into that lesion. And then subsequently, based on the size, we'll decrease the actual injection of medication. Caregivers should always wear protective um, gloves, eyewear anytime they are changing dressings or changing um, the, the lesion sites or cleaning the lesion sites to prevent transmission of the herpes virus. The method of administration is done um, 
under the skin. So basically you're injecting directly into the lesion in a fan-like approach. And, all right, Fern, you, I might need you up here to help me get through this. Escape. Click on this. Open. Voila, okay, and here we go. These are actually melanoma lesions here. Watch how the inject in, he'll withdraw a little bit, fan out into the lesion so that you're injecting the whole lesion of that area. Now this little white cream there, that's called amla cream. That's a topical lidocaine that we apply to help decrease the pain associated with it. So basically we are injecting the actual lesion here. She, this patient initially started with a 12 lesions on her leg. She's down to two. Now we are going to go in and resect those lesions from that and make her leg disease free. So this works and it works, um, it's impressive in how it works. The problem is, or I, I say the qualifying thing that happens with this is you have to give it time. They, the uh, manufacturer recommends waiting uh, or get, administering it for about a six month period to get that overall effect. The majority of time when we are injecting this, I don't see a result until about three months into it. So it's, um, and if, if you are going into this therapy and you know somebody who is, encourage them to be patient because it does work. Um, the mechanism of action, basically you inject it into the tumor, the tumor will um, break open, cause it to, to um, lice and remove, uh, release tumor cells, which uh, will stimulate an immune response because your body is making antigens to something that's viral. Your body will then go in and attack that and break it down and create cellular death. The most common complications are necrosis or ulceration at the site. They weep for a while. We have to keep a, um, an occlusive dressing, meaning it, it keeps the, the lesion from being able to seep onto other things. Um, so those dressings have to be done. We usually keep it on in place for one week. It's a, a plastic dressing we keep over top. If it comes off, we encourage you to wash it off and then reapply an occlusive dressing until it's no longer leaping or, or it's scabbed over. And that decreases the viral load. Um, this is just the immune reaction. The important safety issues are, again, no pregnant people in the room or around the patient when they have active or open lesions. You do not want to inject in any immunocompromised patients. The overall side effects that I've seen is pain or tenderness when we're injecting, um, the messiness sometimes of the dressings because they, they do weep quite a bit and um, some patients complain of headaches, fatigue. You can get an overall herpes type of reaction which can be treated with um, the herpes virus uh, medication the, um, to decrease those overall ref effects. Um, fevers, chills, usually it's pretty well tolerated though. You come in and you inject and then you just wait. Inject and wait. That's about it, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of rushed through that. I see Patty's back there giving me the two-minute signs. The thing that I want you to remember is love the skin you're in because it's the only one you're going to get. Um, anything new, different, or changing on your skin, always remember it's better in a bucket than on you. Go to your dermatologist, have your, your skin checked regularly, and just protect yourself. But don't remember or don't forget to have fun at the same time. This, this disease does not limit you, and it does not define you. It only makes you better. Any question, though? Anybody? Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What? <laughs> How long is your herpes treatment? The the Mligic treatment it goes on for about six months. Um, once you have a durable response from that, you can hold off to from injecting any additional ones. If over time they reoccur, you can always reuse it. It's not a one-time, once-and-done type of therapy. It's one that you can re reuse over time and reinstitute if there's any recurrent lesions in the same spot or elsewhere. On the antidote about the treatment, those, um, some patient, when they first get reaction to the leg from the injection, they kind of get scared because it does get red, it does get inflamed and ulcerated. 
we, we can treat it still. We can give them antibiotics and, and treat the infection. We have information for that. But the benefit, you will see that over a long time. Over a long period of time. We have to encourage them to continue the treatment for everyone. Yeah. Any other questions? Hold on a second. Can you all hear me without a microphone? Okay. Oh, I guess it's picking up on me. So you had mentioned about the weak advantages, and obviously sometimes these things are maybe on your back or some of our patients can. The caregiver, whoever does that, you've got to be very careful. How yes, and we give them gloves to, to use to clean the area, and we give you plastic bags to put your, uh, dispose of your, your, uh, old or used dressings so that it contains the virus. But in reality, if the caregiver already has the herpes virus, it's really not dangerous for them, right? There's no risk in reinfecting them, but it can increase, it can make a, a an outbreak, a, a current outbreak, because the herpes virus is a latent virus and it goes dormant. And you can have active or dormant disease, and it can stimulate an active outbreak. And anybody who's had herpes or uh, an eruption, you, you try to avoid those as much as possible, yeah. Okay, and this is only if they don't have uh, open involvement, right? What's that? You can do this only if there's no open no. no, that's the beauty of this. You can offer this in people who have metastatic disease. In fact, we're currently using it in patients who have lung metastasis, but they have local disease that's problematic, that's hurtful, that's uh, progressing. So we inject the lesions. We do it in conjunction with their systemic adjuvant therapy. So it's it's on top of of their adjuvant therapy and can be or can be a single it can be a single uh, agent as well a therapy. We, we recommend it in people who have a lot of, of recurrent disease in a limb, who are, there are too many spots or too many lesions to remove surgically. We'll treat them and try to shrink them down to an area like this one patient we had that had 12 lesions, and that went from her hip all the way down to her ankle. So we obviously couldn't go in Swiss cheese or leg, so what we've done is we treated those lesions, and now she's down to two lesions, one on her thigh and one on her posterior calf. So those are the lesions. They're responding, but they're just not responding slowly. And she's been, she, she's been actually on for over a year. She's been very patient, and, and you know, she's seen the results, and so she's been encouraged to go ahead. So at this point in time, we're going to say, okay, let's just go cut these out and watch the other ones. Now, if in the event she reoccurs in any of those areas, we can also reinitiate the hemolytic therapy at that time and re-inject those areas or if there's any new areas we can inject them as well. So as Lisa said earlier, this treatment is not first line therapy. It's only after you have recurrent disease. So when you first get diagnosed, you still have to go through surgery. Right. You need a wide excision and all that. This is recurrent disease on your skin. So you have nodules on the skin. And recurrent disease that, that um, is too bulky or too numerous for surgical resection at that time. Always our primary intervention is going to be surgery, if, if at all possible. Get it out of there. Get it gone. That's our goal. And then as far as treating it, when you have systemic uh, disease in, like in your lungs or heart, Dr. Kendra is going to cover that a little bit more in metastatic disease later So on. it can be done concurrently with, with other um, mod modalities of, of treatment. So it's, it's promising, it's encouraging. We are in an exciting time for melanoma treatments, a lot farther than where I was when I started out 20 years ago. So we're in, we're in a good place. All right, without further ado, thank you, Dr. Thank Benzel. you.